episode 560. As you were. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am unemployed, which is code for I'm fine. Our contract has ended. Thank you, legislature of Pennsylvania. It's been a long, strange trip, but it was a really, really good one. Training contact tracers and case investigators and working with the Pennsylvania Department of Health has been fascinating and rewarding and edifying, but to sound like a total cliched beach novel, the, the, best, the best part was the people you meet along the way. I got lucky, just like when I was teaching in New York City, to be surrounded by a team of people who were extraordinary. And I mean, nobody goes out for a job as a contact tracer who doesn't want to be a helper, going back to Mr. Rogers, a helper instead of a terror downer. <laughs> That's the technical terminology, you know. It was, what, nine months, 10 months of being surrounded by really, really wonderful people start to finish. So big thank you to everyone around the country who has gone out to work in contact tracing, whether you're volunteer or you're being paid for your time, your extraordinary amount of time. It's really wonderful. On the other side of my life, those of you who have listened for a really long time probably need to sit down. We just celebrated Aaron's 21st birthday. I know. I'm still, I'm having issues. <laughs> it's difficult. If I can upload it, I, I took a series of pictures of Aaron having a sip of a Jack and Ginger where he's making goofy faces and really being quite funny. If I can export it properly... You will get to hear their voices, both Aaron and Aiden, and see them being their goofy selves. I will also export something that Aiden was encouraging me to do, which is, uh, there's a whole thing. If you, if you don't have kids who watch TikTok or who have been on YouTube for, I don't know, the last 10 years, 15 years, there's a thing that occurs often. Oh, and on Instagram too, I think now speed painting, where people record themselves doing something painting-wise, whether it's digitally on the Procreate app, which can automatically record what your pencil is doing on the screen, or whether it's painting in, in real time. So I tried it with a picture of the boys from Aaron's dinner, and I've sped it up four times, I think. It was an interesting experiment. I don't know if I'm going to do it again. He thinks that I should be putting out a playlist on YouTube of me doing speed versions of whatever crafty thing I'm up to. Um, so it would be mostly just my hands, watching my hands, and maybe me talking about it. I'm still not sure about that. Anyway, I'll, I'll see if I can get that uploaded for you and in the show notes as well. Obviously, lots of things have been put on hold while I was working like crazy on the contact tracing thing. So I'm going to get back into fixing broken things on various websites and cleaning things up like that. And we are nearing the end of Northanger Abbey, which means I have to pick our next book. I think I know which way I'm going to go. I'm not positive yet, but it is probably going to be a mystery. Not like Woman in White. Nothing can be like Woman in White right? Along with going out to dinner for Aaron's birthday. Yes, that was kind of shocking to be in a restaurant. Uh, we are all four of us now fully vaccinated. And even so, anytime we walk in anywhere, we are all wearing masks. We just don't want to freak people out because, you know, it's not like you're walking around with a t-shirt on that says, hey, I got vaccinated. So we we're doing our best to make sure that uh, we don't add to confusion or stress for other people. But we did absolutely take our masks off and have dinner indoors. And then we went to see the movie In the Heights, which was also kind of surreal because there were four other people in the theater. It was great. 
to be in a theater again, but it was most great to see In the Heights. If you've ever wanted to see a slice of a life that you may not otherwise have any contact to. It reminded me in that way of the movie that came out several years ago called Big Sick that was, I think it was pretty autobiographical. It was Kamal Nanjiani. He's in Silicon Valley and a bunch of, bunch of other stuff. But Holly Hunter was in it and Ray Romano was in it. And well, In the Heights definitely gives you kind of a fiddler on the roof vision of a life that you may not otherwise have any contact with. What do I mean by fiddler on the roof? What I mean is Anthony Ramos, who was the original Broadway John Lawrence and Philip Hamilton. He plays Usnavi, who you will love when you watch the movie, finding out why his name is Usnavi. He plays Usnavi, who's very much like Tevya. He starts by saying good morning to you directly to the camera and welcoming you to his little world. And then he goes out in ever-widening concentric circles, showing you, this is my family, and it's an interesting family. It's not a United States Census Bureau 2.5 children white picket fence family. It's a much more dynamic setup that he is living in. And then you find out what his role is and his family's roles. And then you go the next level out. These are the friends. These are the people who you have contact with all the time. And what are their roles? What are their jobs? How do they function within this close-knit society? It is absolutely beautiful. And just like with Hamilton, where you have everything from show tunes and R&B to bebop and real hardcore Rodgers and Hammerstein throwbacks, both in lyrics and in musical style, he does the same thing with In the Heights except on a slightly different level. You definitely get the, the show tunes, and you have some extraordinary Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers film moments towards the end of the movie. It's just breathtaking. But you are hearing different musical styles of Latin music and Caribbean music that go along with the character who you are watching. So there's a, a whole several layers of depth and information giving going on all the way throughout the movie. You may catch all of it. You may catch none of it. You may just find that it is a beautifully uplifting, happy movie. And how needed is that right now? So needed. It was lovely. Just, just, just lovely. I know there's been controversy about it. Uh, we were talking about it a little bit on the, the Craftlet Zoom call last night, which, again, you are welcome to, and links are in the show notes. Carmen and I both noted that we both recognized that the controversy is legit. It's sad that the first time you have real uh, representation of an enormous complex, non-white portion of the, the country, there is an almost immediate backlash against it. At the same time, Lin-Manuel Miranda's response is, I'm listening. I get it. I recognize what you're saying. I'm listening. I'll do better next time. Which is lovely. And so grown up. He's just, he's a mensch, is what he is. But controversy aside, Go in knowing that you are not going to see a whole lot of dark-skinned Caribbean Latin actors, for what it's worth. It's true. The director of the film is the same director who did Crazy Rich Asians. He is, as one of the interviewers on a video interview that I saw on YouTube, one of the interviewers said, amazingly good at food porn. And the f don't go to this movie hungry. Because when they eat, oh my goodness, yes, please. Especially having uh, spent a, a good portion of my life in, in Tucson, where the carne is so good. And it's hard to find done right elsewhere. It was lovely. It was just lovely. So I'm going to stop rambling about that. 
and instead switch to rambling about other things. First and foremost, Northanger Abbey. So, we are, like I said, heading in towards the end of the book. In fact, I think next week, I think there are three chapters left after today. And I think next week will be the end of the book. There's not a whole lot that you need to know before we listen to today's chapter. One of the cool tidbitty kind of things is you will hear a reference to the loud noise of the house bell. And house bell is hyphenated, H-O-U-S-E hyphen B as in boy, E-L-L. This appears to be, according to the OED, one of the earliest moments that we have seen a reference to a doorbell in literature. They weren't normal before this. This is, this is a big deal. Even though you may have had bell poles inside the house that allowed you to alert the serving staff, Downton Abbey style, that you were ready for or that you needed whatever it was that they were about to, to prepare or bring you. Doorbells didn't really exist. You had knockers, Scrooge Marley-like, but you didn't have doorbells, evidently. So just know that when you hear the reference to the house bell, you can feel smug and self-satisfied knowing that this little Jane Austen book happens to have one of the first references. 70 miles of travel at seven to eight miles an hour was totally doable at the time in a carriage, in a post chaise, uh, traveling by post, like we talked about before, where you go kind of station to station or post to post, where uh, horses get switched out and you can get a snack if you want to, and then you get back in the carriage and keep going uh, once the new team of horses has been attached. 70 miles traveling somewhere between seven and eight miles an hour, standard issue travel time of seven to eight miles an hour, that would take you 10 or 11 hours minimum to do. Absolutely doable. It would be weird to do that on a Sunday, however. Mail would still have gone and people would still have traveled, but it would have been fewer people than you would see other days of the week, and it would be a little bit more extraordinary to be a person doing the traveling at that time, on that day. You will hear a term used that is used in kind of a complicated way. Later in the chapters we're doing today, you're going to hear this last half to a sentence, and perhaps involve the innocent with the guilty in undistinguishing ill will. Undistinguishing would be, in our terminology, more like indiscriminate. So you would involve somebody who is innocent, you'd conflate them with the guilty, put them all together in the same bowl, and not be able to distinguish who is behaving from ill will versus who is behaving from, you know, the best information they had at the time, doing the best they can. So undistinguishing is really indiscriminate. Last week, we talked about a sweep. This week, we talk about a sweep gate. You will hear this reference. This is the gate from the road, separating the road from the sweep itself. Leading up to the sweep, the, the rounded part of the, what we would call in the States driveway, that would allow you to drive a carriage up to the front door without having to back it up, back down the the rest of the driveway back down to the road. The sweep gate separated the property from the road and could lead to a long straight drive that ended in a sweep, or it could go just right into the sweep itself. But you'll hear a reference to a sweep gate, and that is all that it's talking about. And it does mean that you would probably have to stop, get out, open the gate, get back in, drive through the gate, stop, close the gate. This is why you had gatekeepers. <laughs> and those little gatehouses, because what a pain that would be if you were in a hurry. Just like today on trains and planes where there's a seat back pocket in front of you, carriages that were traveling post, things that carried uh, people who didn't own the carriages, 
often had little pockets sewn into the sidewalls so that you could put, you know, stump something to read or embroidery or whatever. You would have some place to put it other than your lap or in your bag that's strapped to the back of the carriage. So there were inner pockets inside carriages for people to stow stuff while they were traveling. And of course, perhaps, Heather, leave things behind, Heather, as you disembark, Heather. You'll hear a reference to Mechlin, M-E-C-H-L-I-N. This was a very fine, rather intricate lace that was made in Flanders, in Mechlin, Flanders. I'm probably pronouncing Mechlin wrong. And as you can imagine, anything that is lace and fine and intricate would be expensive and therefore very desirable. And I think that's everything you need. Because, you know, we're, as we get closer to the end of these books, we have fewer and fewer weird new situations or new terminology. There's a lot of terminology in today's chapters that we'd already gone over because it's just getting re-referenced. But I don't want to spoil anything. I am going to launch us now into chapters 28 and 29 of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by the lovely Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 28. Soon after this, the general found himself obliged to go to London for a week, and he left Northanger, earnestly regretting that any necessity should rob him even for an hour of Miss Morland's company, and anxiously recommending the study of her comfort and amusement to his children as their chief object in his absence. His departure gave Catherine the first experimental conviction that a loss may be sometimes a gain. The happiness with which their time now passed, every employment voluntary, every laugh indulged, every meal a scene of ease and good humour, walking where they liked and when they liked, their hours, pleasures and fatigues at their own command, made her thoroughly sensible of the restraint which the general's presence had imposed, and most thankfully feel their present release from it. Such ease and such delights made her love the place and the people more and more every day, and had it not been for a dread of it soon becoming expedient to leave the one, and an apprehension of not being equally beloved by the other, she would, at each moment of each day, have been perfectly happy. But she was now in the fourth week of her visit. Before the general came home, the fourth week would be turned, and perhaps it might seem an intrusion if she stayed much longer. This was a painful consideration whenever it occurred, and eager to get rid of such a weight on her mind, she very soon resolved to speak to Eleanor about it at once, propose going away, and be guided in her conduct by the manner in which her proposal might be taken. Aware that if she gave herself much time she might feel it difficult to bring forward so unpleasant a subject, she took the first opportunity of being suddenly alone with Eleanor, and of Eleanor's being in the middle of a speech about something very different, to start forth her obligation of going away very soon. Eleanor looked and declared herself much concerned. She had hoped for the pleasure of her company for a much longer time, had been misled, perhaps by her wishes, to suppose that a much longer visit had been promised, and could not but think that if Mr and Mrs Morland were aware of the pleasure it was to have her there, they would be too generous to hasten her return. Catherine explained, "'Oh, as to that, Papa and Mamma were in no hurry at all. As long as she was happy, they would always be satisfied. Then why might she ask in such a hurry herself to leave them? Oh, because she'd been there so long. Nay, if you can use such a word, I can urge you no farther. If you think it long, oh, no, I do not indeed. For my own pleasure, I could stay with you as long again.' and it was directly settled that till she had, her leaving them was not even to be thought of. In having this cause of uneasiness so pleasantly removed, the force of the other was likewise weakened. The kindness, the earnestness of Eleanor's manner in pressing her to stay, and Henry's gratified look on being told that her stay was determined, were such sweet proofs of her importance with them, as left her only just so much solitude as the human mind can ever do comfortably without. She did almost always believe that Henry loved her, and quite always that his father and sister loved and even wished her to belong to them, 
and believing so far her doubts and anxieties were merely sportive irritations. Henry was not able to oblige his father's injunction of remaining wholly at Northanger in attendance on the ladies during his absence in London, the engagement of his curate at Woodston obliging him to leave them on Saturday for a couple of nights. His loss was not now what it had been while the general was at home. It lessened their gaiety but did not ruin their comfort, and the two girls, agreeing in occupation and improving in intimacy, found themselves so well sufficient for the time to themselves that it was eleven o'clock, rather a late hour at the Abbey, before they quitted the supper-room on the day of Henry's departure. They had just reached the head of the stairs when it seemed, as far as the thickness of the walls would allow them to judge, that a carriage was driving up to the door, and the next moment confirmed the idea by the loud noise of the house-bell. After the first perturbation of a surprise had passed away, in a good heaven what can be the matter? It was quickly decided by Eleanor to be her eldest brother, whose arrival was often as sudden if not so unseasonable, and accordingly she hurried down to welcome him. Catherine walked on to her chamber, making up her mind as well as she could to a further acquaintance with Captain Tilney, and comforting herself under the unpleasant impression his conduct had given her, and the persuasion of his being far too fine a gentleman to approve of her, that at least they should not meet under such circumstances would make their meeting materially painful. She trusted he would never speak of Miss Thorpe, and indeed, as he must by this time be ashamed of the part he had acted, there could be no danger of it, and as long as all mention of bath scenes were avoided, she thought she could behave to him very civilly. In such considerations time passed away, and it was certainly in his favour that Eleanor should be glad to see him, and have so much to say, for half an hour was almost gone since his arrival, and Eleanor did not come up. At that moment Catherine thought she heard her step in the gallery, and listened for its continuance, but all was silent. Scarcely, however, had she convicted her fancy of error, when the noise of something moving close to her door made her start. It seemed as if someone was touching the very doorway, and in another moment a slight motion of the lock proved that some hand must be upon it. She trembled a little at the idea of anyone's approaching so cautiously, but resolving not to be again so overcome by trivial appearances of alarm or misled by a raised imagination, she stepped quietly forward and opened the door. Eleanor, and only Eleanor, stood there. Catherine's spirits, however, were tranquillised, but for an instant, for Eleanor's cheeks were pale, and her manner greatly agitated. Though evidently intending to come in, it seemed an effort to enter the room, and still greater to speak when there. Catherine, supposing some uneasiness on Captain Tilney's account, could only express her concern by silent attention, obliged her to be seated, rubbed her temples with lavender water, and hung over her with affectionate solicitude. "'My dear Catherine, you must not, you must not indeed,' were Eleanor's first connected words. "'I'm quite well. This kindness distracts me. I cannot bear it. I come to you on such an errand.' "'Errand? To me? How shall I tell you? Oh, how shall I tell you?' A new idea now darted into Catherine's mind, and turning as pale as her friend, she exclaimed, "'Tis a messenger from Woodston!' "'You are mistaken indeed,' returned Eleanor, looking at her most compassionately. "'It is no one from Woodston. It is my father himself.' Her voice faltered, and her eyes were turned to the ground as she mentioned his name. His unlooked-for return was enough in itself to make Catherine's heart sink, and for a few moments she hardly supposed there were anything worse to be told.' She said nothing, and Eleanor, endeavouring to collect herself and speak with firmness, but with eyes still cast down, soon went on. You are too good, I'm sure, to think the worse of me for the part I'm obliged to perform. I am indeed a most unwilling messenger. After what has so lately passed, so lately been settled between us, how joyfully, how thankfully on my side as to your continuing here, as I hoped, for many, many weeks longer— how can I tell you that your kindness is not to be accepted, and that the happiness your company has hitherto given us is to be repaid by? But I must not trust myself with words. My dear Catherine, we are to part. My father has recollected an engagement that takes our whole family away on Monday. We're going to Lord Longtown's near Hereford for a fortnight. 
explanation and apology are equally impossible. I cannot attempt either. My dear Eleanor, cried Catherine, suppressing her feelings as well as she could, do not be so distressed. The second engagement must give way to a first. I'm very, very sorry we are to part so soon, and so suddenly too, but I'm not offended. Indeed I'm not. I can finish my visit here, you know, any time, or I hope you will come to me. Can you, when you return from this lord's, come to Fullerton? It will not be in my power, Catherine. Come when you can, then. Eleanor made no answer, and Catherine's thoughts recurring to something more directly interesting, she added, thinking aloud, Monday, so soon as Monday, and you're all to go. Well, I'm certain of... I shall be able to take leave, however. I need not go till just before you do, you know. Do not be distressed, Eleanor. I can go on Monday very well. My father and mother, having no notice of it, is very little consequence. The general will send a servant with me, I dare say, half the way, and then I shall soon be at Salisbury, and then I'm only nine miles from home. Ah, oh, Catherine, were it settled so, it would be somewhat less intolerable. And though in such common attentions you would have received but half of what you ought. But how can I tell you? Tomorrow morning is fixed for your leaving us, and not even the hour is left to your choice. The very carriage is ordered, and we'll be here at seven o'clock, and no servant will be offered you. Catherine sat down, breathless and speechless. I could hardly believe my senses when I heard it, and no displeasure, no resentment that you could feel at this moment, however justly great, can be more than myself. But I must not talk of what I felt. Oh, that I could suggest anything in extenuation. Good God, what will your father and mother say, after courting you from the protection of real friends to this, almost double distance from your home, to have you driven out of the house without the considerations of even decent civility? Dear, dear Catherine, in being the bearer of such a message, I seem guilty myself of all its insult, yet I trust you will acquit me, for... For you must have been long enough in this house to see that I am but a nominal mistress of it, that my real power is nothing. Have I offended the general? said Catherine in a faltering voice. Alas, for my feelings as a daughter, all I know, all that I can answer for, that you can have given him no cause for offence. He certainly is greatly, very greatly discomposed. I have seldom seen him more so. His temper is not happy. And something has now occurred to ruffle it in an uncommon degree, some disappointment, some vexation, which just at this moment seems important, but which I can hardly suppose you to have any concern in. For how is it possible? It was with pain that Catherine could speak at all, and it was only for Eleanor's sake that she attended it. I'm sure, she said, I'm very sorry if I have offended him, but it was the last thing I would willingly have done. But do not be unhappy, Eleanor. An engagement, you know, must be kept. I'm only sorry that it was not recollected sooner that I might have written home, but it is of very little consequence. I hope, I earnestly hope that to your real safety it will be of none, but to everything else it is of the greatest consequence. To comfort, appearance, propriety to your family or to the world, were your friends the Allens still in Bath, you might go to them with comparative ease. A few hours would take you there, but a journey of seventy miles to be taken post by you at your age, alone, unattended. Though the journey is nothing, do not think about that, and if we are to part a few hours sooner or later, you know, makes no difference. I can be ready by seven. Let me be called in time. Eleanor saw that she wished to be alone, and believing it better for each that they should avoid any further conversation, now left her with... I shall see you in the morning. Catherine's swelling heart needed relief. In Eleanor's presence, friendship and pride had equally restrained her tears, but no sooner was she gone that they burst forth in torrents. Turned from the house, and in such a way, without any reason that could justify, any apology that could atone for the abruptness, the rudeness, nay, the insolence of it. Henry at a distance, not able even to bid him farewell. Every hope, every expectation from him suspended, at least, and who could say how long? Who could say when they might meet again? 
and all this by such a man as General Tilney, so polite, so well-bred, and herefore too so particularly fond of her. It was incomprehensible. It was as incomprehensible as it was mortifying and grievous. From what it could arise and where it would end were considerations of equal perplexity and alarm. The manner in which it was done so grossly uncivil, hurrying her away without any reference to her own convenience, or allowing her even the appearance of choice as to the time or mode of her travelling, of two days, the earliest fixed on, and of that almost the earliest hour, as if resolved to have her gone before he was stirring in the morning, that he might not be obliged even to see her. What could all this mean but an intentional affront? By some means or other she must have had the misfortune to offend him. Eleanor had wished to spare her from so painful a notion, but Catherine could not believe it possible that any injury or misfortune could provoke such ill will against a person not connected, or at least not supposed to be connected with it. Heavily passed the night. Sleep or repose that deserved the name of sleep was out of the question. That room in which her disturbed imagination had tormented her on her first arrival was again the scene of agitated spirits and unquiet slumbers. Yet how different now the source of her inquietude from what it had been then! How mournfully superior in reality and substance! Her anxiety had foundation in fact, her fears in probability and with a mind so occupied in the contemplation of actual and natural evil, the solitude of her situation, the darkness of her chamber, the antiquity of the building, were felt and considered without the smallest emotion. And though the wind was high, and often produced strange and sudden noises through the house, she heard it all as she lay awake, hour after hour, without curiosity or terror. Soon after six, Eleanor entered her room, eager to show attention or give assistance where it was possible, but very little remained to be done. Catherine had not loitered. She was almost dressed and her packing almost finished. The possibility of some conciliatory message from the general occurred to her as his daughter appeared. What so natural as that anger should pass away and repentance succeed it, and she only wanted to know how far after what had passed an apology might be properly received by her. But the knowledge would have been useless here, it was not called for. Neither clemency nor dignity was put to the trial. Eleanor brought no message. Very little passed between them on meeting. Each found her greatest safety in silence, and few and trivial were the sentences exchanged while they remained upstairs. Catherine in busy agitation, contemplating her dress, and Eleanor, with more good will than experience, intent on filling the trunk. When everything was done, they left the room. Catherine lingering only half a minute behind her friend to throw a parting glance on every well-known cherished object and went down to the breakfast parlour where breakfast was prepared. She tried to eat as well as save herself from the pain of being urged to make her friend comfortable but she had no appetite and could not swallow many mouthfuls. The contrast between this and her last breakfast in that room gave her fresh misery and strengthened her distaste for everything before her. It was not four and twenty hours ago since they had met there to the same repast, but in circumstances how different! With what cheerful ease, what happy though false security, had she then looked around her, enjoying everything present, and fearing little in future, beyond Henry's going to Woodston for a day. Happy, happy breakfast, for Henry had been there. Henry had sat by her and helped her. These reflections were long indulged, undisturbed by any address from her companion, who sat as deep in thought as herself, and the appearance of the carriage was the first thing to startle and recoil them to the present moment. Catherine's colour rose at the sight of it, and the indignity with which she was treated, striking at that instant on her mind with peculiar force, made her for a short time sensible only of resentment. Eleanor seemed now impelled into resolution and speech. "'You must write to me, Catherine,' she cried. "'You must let me hear from you as soon as possible. "'Till I know you to be safe at home, I shall not have an hour's comfort. "'For one letter, at all risks, all hazards, I must entreat. "'Let me have the satisfaction of knowing that you're safe at Fullerton "'and have found your family well. "'And then, till I can ask for your correspondence as I ought to do, "'I will not expect more. 
direct to me at Lord Longtown's, and I must ask it under cover to Alice. No, Eleanor, if you're not allowed to receive a letter from me, I'm sure I'd better not write. There can be no doubt of my getting home safe. Eleanor only replied, I cannot wonder at your feelings. I will not importune you. I will trust to your own kindness of heart when I am at a distance from you. But this, with a look of sorrow accompanying it, was enough to melt Catherine's pride in a moment, and she instantly said, Oh, Eleanor, I will write to you indeed. There was yet another point which Miss Tilney was anxious to settle, though somewhat embarrassed in speaking of it. It had occurred to her that, after so long an absence from home, Catherine might not be provided with money enough for the expense of her journey, and upon suggesting it to her with the most affectionate offers of accommodation, it proved to be exactly the case. Catherine had never thought on the subject till that moment, but upon examining her purse was convinced that, but for this kindness of her friend, she might have been turned from the house without even the means of getting home, and the distress in which she must have been thereby involved, filling the minds of both, scarcely another word was said by other during the time of their remaining together. Short, however, was that time. The carriage was soon announced to be ready, and Catherine, instantly rising, a long and affectionate embrace supplied the place of language in bidding each other adieu, and as they entered the hall, unable to leave the house, without some mention of one whose name had not been yet spoken by either, she paused a moment, and with quivering lips, just made it intelligible that she left her kind remembrance for her absent friend. But with this approach to his name ended all possibility of restraining her feelings, and hiding her face as well as she could with her handkerchief, she darted across the hall, jumped into the chaise, and in a moment was driven from the door. Chapter 29 Catherine was too wretched to be fearful. The journey in itself had no terrors for her, and she began it without either dreading its length or feeling its solitariness. Leaning back in one corner of the carriage, in a violent burst of tears, she was conveyed some miles beyond the walls of the abbey before she raised her head, and the highest point of ground within the park was almost close from her view before she was capable of turning her eyes towards it. Unfortunately, the road she now travelled was the same, which only ten days ago she had so happily passed along in going to and from Woodston, and for fourteen miles every bitter feeling was rendered more severe by the review of the objects on which she had first looked under impressions so different. Every mile, as it brought her nearer to Woodston, added to her sufferings, and when, within the distance of five, she passed the turning which led to it, and thought of Henry so near yet so unconscious, her grief and agitation were excessive. The day which she had spent at that place had been one of the happiest of her life. It was there, it was on that day, that the General had made use of such expressions with regard to Henry and herself, had so spoken and so looked as to give her the most positive conviction of his actually wishing their marriage. Yes, only ten days ago had he elated her by his pointed regard, had he even confused her by his too significant reference. And now, what had she done? What had she omitted to do to merit such a change? The only offence against him, of which she could accuse herself, had been such as was scarcely possible to reach his knowledge. Henry and her own heart only were privy to the shocking suspicions which she had so idly entertained, and equally safe did she believe her secret with each. Designedly, at least, Henry could not have betrayed her. If indeed, by any strange mischance, his father should have gained intelligence of what he had dared to think and look for, for her causeless fancies and injurious examinations, she could not wonder at any degree of his indignation. If aware of her having viewed him as a murderer, she could not wonder at his even turning her from his house. But a justification so full of torture to herself, she trusted would not be in his power. Anxious as were all her conjectures on this point, it was not, however, the one on which she dwelt most. There was the thought yet nearer, a more prevailing, more impetuous concern. How Henry would think and feel and look when he returned on the morrow to Northanger and heard of her being gone was a question of force and interest to rise over every other. To be never ceasing, 
alternately irritating and soothing. It sometimes suggested the dread of his calm acquiescence, and at others was answered by the sweetest confidence in his regret and resentment. To the general, of course, he would not dare speak, but to Eleanor, what might he not say to Eleanor about her? In this unceasing recurrence of doubts and inquiries on any one article of which her mind was incapable of more than momentary repose, the hours passed away, and her journey advanced much faster than she looked for. The pressing anxieties of thought which prevented her from noticing anything before her, when, once beyond the neighbourhood of Woodston, saved her at the same time from watching her progress, and though no object on the road could engage a moment's attention, she found no stage of it tedious. From this she was preserved, too, by another course, by feeling no eagerness for her journey's conclusion, for to returning in such a manner to Fullerton was almost to destroy the pleasure of meeting with those she loved best. Even after an absence such as hers, an eleven weeks' absence, what had she to say that would not humble herself and pain her family, that would not increase her own grief by the confession of it, extend a useless resentment, and perhaps involve the innocent with the guilty in undistinguishing ill-will? She could never do any justice to Henry and Eleanor's merit. She felt it too strongly for expression, and should a dislike be taken against them, should they be thought of unfavourably on their father's account, it would cut her to the heart. With these feelings, she rather dreaded than sought for the first view of that well-known spire which would announce her within twenty miles of home. Salisbury she had known to be her point on leaving Northanger, but after the first stage she had been indebted to the postmasters for the names of the places which were to then conduct her to it. So great had been her ignorance of her route. She met with nothing, however, to distress or frighten her. Her youth, civil manners and liberal pay procured her the, all the attention that a traveller like herself could require, and stopping only to change horses, she travelled on for about eleven hours, without accident or alarm, and between six or seven o'clock in the evening found herself entering Fullerton. A heroine, returning at the close of her career to her native village, in all the triumph of recovered reputation and all the dignity of a countess, with a long train of noble relations in their several phaetons, and three waiting-maids in a travelling chaise and four behind her, is an event on which the pen of the contriver might well delight to dwell. It gives credit to every conclusion, and the author must share in the glory that she so liberally bestows. But my affair is widely different. I bring back my heroine to her home in solitude and disgrace, and no sweet elation of spirits can lead me into my muteness. A heroine in a hack-post chaise is such a blow upon sentiment as no attempt at grandeur or pathos can withstand. Swiftly, therefore, shall her post-boy drive through the village amid the gaze of Sunday groups, and speedily shall be her descent from it. But whatever might be the distress of Catherine's mind as she thus advanced towards the parsonage, and whatever the humiliation of her biography in relating it, she was preparing enjoyment of no everyday nature for those to whom she went, first in the appearance of her carriage, and secondly in herself. The chaise of a traveller being a rare sight in Fullerton, the whole family were immediately at the window, and to have it stop at the sweep-gate was a pleasure to brighten every eye and occupy every fancy, a pleasure quite unlooked for by all but the two youngest children, a boy and girl of six and four years old, who expected a brother or sister in every carriage. Happy the glance that first distinguished Catherine, happy the voice that proclaimed the discovery. But whether such happiness were the lawful property of George or Harriet could never be exactly understood. Her father, mother, Sarah, George and Harriet, all assembled at the door to welcome her with affectionate eagerness, was a sight to awaken the best feelings of Catherine's heart, and in the embrace of each she stepped from the carriage. She found herself soothed before anything that she had believed possible. So surrounded, so caressed, she was even happy. In the joyfulness of family love, everything for a short time was subdued, and the pleasure of seeing her, leaving them at first little leisure for calm curiosity, they were all seated round the tea-table, which Mrs. Morland had hurried for the comfort of the poor traveller, whose pale and jaded look soon caught her notice before any inquiry so direct 
as to a demand a positive answer was addressed to her. Reluctantly and with much hesitation did she then begin what might perhaps at the end of half an hour be termed by the courtesy of the hearers an explanation. But scarcely within that time could they at all discover the cause or collect the particulars of her sudden return. They were far from being an irritable race, far from any quickness in catching or bitterness in resenting affronts. But here, when the whole was unfolded, was an insult not to be overlooked, nor for the first half hour to be easily pardoned. Without suffering any romantic alarm in the consideration of their daughter's long and lonely journey, Mr and Mrs Morland could not but feel that it might have been productive of much unpleasantness to her, that it was what they could never have voluntarily suffered, and that in forcing her on such a measure, General Tilney had acted neither honourably nor feelingly, neither as a gentleman nor as a parent. Why he had done it, what could have provoked him to such a breach of hospitality, and so suddenly turned all his partial regard for their daughter into actual ill-will, was a matter which they were at least as far from divining as Catherine herself. But it did not oppress them by any means so long, and after a due course of useless conjecture that it was a strange business and that he must be a very strange man, grew enough for all their indignation and wonder. Sarah, indeed, still indulged in the sweets of incomprehensibility, exclaiming and conjecturing with youthful ardour. "'My dear, you give yourself a great deal of needless trouble,' said her mother at last. "'Depend upon it. It is something not at all worth understanding.' "'I can allow for his wishing Catherine away when he recollected this engagement,' said Sarah. "'But why not do it civilly?' "'I am very sorry for the young people,' returned Mrs Morland. "'They must have a sad time of it. "'But as for anything else, it's no matter now. "'Catherine is safe at home, and our comfort does not depend on General Tilney.' "'Catherine sighed. "'Well,' continued her philosophical mother, I am glad I did not know of your journey at the time, but now it is all over, perhaps there is no great harm done. It is always good for young people to be put upon exerting themselves. And you know, my dear Catherine, you always were a sad little shatter-brained creature. But now you must have been forced to have your wits about you, with so much changing of chaises and so forth. And I hope it will appear that you have not left anything behind you in any of the pockets. Catherine hoped so too, and tried to feel an interest in her own amendment. But her spirits were quite worn down, and to be silent and alone becoming soon her only wish, she readily agreed to her mother's next counsel of going early to bed. Her parents, seeing nothing in her ill looks and agitation but the natural consequences of mortified feelings and the unusual exertions and fatigue of such a journey, parted from her without any doubt of their being soon slept away and though when they all met the next morning her recovery was not equal to their hopes, they were still perfectly unsuspicious of there being any deeper evil. They never once thought of her heart, which for the parents of a young lady of seventeen, just returned from her first excursion from home, was odd enough. As soon as breakfast was over, she sat down to fulfil her promise to Miss Tilney, whose trust in the effect of time and distance on her friend's disposition was already justified for already did Catherine reproach herself with having parted from Eleanor coldly, with having neither enough valued her merits or kindness, and never enough commiserated her for what she had been yesterday left to endure. The strength of these feelings, however, was far from assisting her pen, and never had it been harder for her to write than in addressing Eleanor Tilney, to compose a letter which might at once do justice to her sentiments and her situation, convey gratitude without servile regret, be guarded without coldness, and honest without resentment, a letter which Eleanor might not be pained by the perusal of, and above all which she might not blush herself if Henry should chance to see it, was an undertaking to frighten away all her powers of performance, and after long thought and much perplexity, to be very brief was all that she could determine on with any confidence of safety. The money, therefore, which Eleanor had advanced, was enclosed with little more than grateful thanks and the thousand good wishes of a most affectionate heart. "'This has been a strange acquaintance,' observed Mrs Morland as the letter was finished. "'Soon made and soon ended. 
I am sorry it happened so, for Mrs. Allen thought them a very pretty kind of young people, and you were sadly out of luck too in your Isabella. The oh, poor James. Well, we must live and learn, and the next new friends you make, I hope, will be better worth keeping. Catherine coloured as she warmly answered, No friend can be better worth keeping than Eleanor. If so, my dear, I dare say you will meet again some time or other. Do not be uneasy. It is ten to one, but you are thrown together in the course of a few years, and then what a pleasure it will be. Mrs. Morland was not happy in her attempt at consolation. The hope of meeting again in the course of a few years could only put into Catherine's head what might happen in that time to make the meeting dreadful to her. She could never forget Henry Tilney, nor think of him with less tenderness than she did at that moment. But he might forget her, and in that case to meet. Her eyes filled with tears as she pictured her acquaintance so renewed, and her mother, perceiving her comfortable suggestions to have had no good effect, proposed, as another expedient for restoring her spirits, that they should call on Mrs. Allen. The two houses were only a quarter of a mile apart, and as they walked, Mrs. Morland quickly dispatched all that she felt on the score of James's disappointment. "'We are sorry for him,' said she, "'but otherwise there's no harm done in the match going off, "'for it could not be a desirable thing to have him engaged to a girl "'whom we had not the smallest acquaintance with, "'and who was so entirely without fortune. "'And now, after such behaviour, we cannot think at all well of her. "'Just at present it comes hard to poor James, "'but that will not last for ever.' and I dare say he will be a discreeter man all his life for the foolishness of his first choice. This was just such a summary view of the affair as Catherine could listen to. Another sentence might have endangered her complacence and made her reply less rational, for soon were all her thinking powers swallowed up in the reflection of her own change of feelings and spirits since she last had trodden that well-known road. It was not three months ago, since wild with joyful expectation she had there run backwards and forwards some ten times a day, with a heart light, gay and independent, looking forward to pleasures untasted and unalloyed, and free from the apprehension of evil as from the knowledge of it. Three months ago had seen her all this, and now how altered a being did she return? She was received by the Allens with all the kindness which her unlocked-for appearance, acting on steady affection, would naturally call forth. And great was their surprise, and warm their displeasure on hearing how she had been treated, though Mrs. Morland's account of it was no inflated representation, no steady appeal to their passions. Catherine took us quite by surprise yesterday evening, said she. She travelled all the way post by herself, and knew nothing of coming till Saturday night. The General Tilney, for some odd fancy or other, all of a sudden grew tired of having her there, and almost turned her out of the house. Very unfriendly. "'Certainly, and he must be a very odd man. "'But we're so glad to have her amongst us again. "'And it's a great comfort to find that she is not a poor helpless creature, "'but can shift very well for herself.' "'Mr. Allen expressed himself on the occasion "'with the reasonable resentment of a sensible friend, "'and Mrs. Allen thought his expression quite good enough "'to be immediately made use of again by herself. "'His wonder, his conjectures, his explanations "'became in succession hers,' with the addition of this single remark, I really have not the patience with the general, to fill up every accidental pause, and I really have not patience with the general, was uttered twice after Mr. Allen left the room, without any relaxation of anger or any material digression of thought. A more considerable degree of wandering attended a third re repetition, and after completing the fourth, she immediately added, only think, my dear, of my having got that frightful great rent in my best mechlin so charmingly mended before I left Bath that one can hardly see where it was. I must show it to you some day or other. Bath is a nice place, Catherine, after all. I assure you I did not above half like coming away. Mrs. Thorpe's being there was such a comfort to us, was not it? You know you and I were quite forlorn at first. Yes, but that did not last long said Catherine, her eyes brightening at the recollection of what had first given spirit to her existence. Very true, we soon met with Mrs Thorpe and then we wanted for nothing. My dear, do you not think these silk gloves wear very well? I put them on new the first time of our going to the lower rooms, you know, and I've worn them a great deal since. Do you remember that evening? Do I? Oh, perfectly. 
It was very agreeable, was it not? Mr Tilney drank tea with us. I always thought him a great addition. He's so very agreeable. I have a notion you danced with him, but I'm not quite sure. I remember I had my favourite gown on. Catherine could not answer, and after a short trial of other subjects, Mrs Allen again returned to, I really have not patience with the general. Such an agreeable, worthy man as he seemed to be. I do not suppose, Mrs Morland, you ever saw a better-bred man in your life. His lodgings were taken the very day after he left them, Catherine. But no wonder, Milsom Street, you know. As they walked home again, Mrs Morland endeavoured to impress upon her daughter's mind the happiness of having such steady well-wishers as Mr and Mrs Allen, and the very little consideration which the neglect or unkindness of slight acquaintance like the Tilneys ought to have with her while she could preserve the good opinion and affection of her earliest friends. There was a great deal of good sense in all this, but there are some situations of the human mind in which good sense has very little power, and Catherine's feelings contradicted almost every position her mother advanced. It was upon the behaviour of those very slight acquaintance that all her present happiness depended, and while Mrs Morland was successfully confirming her own opinions by the justness of her own representations, Catherine was silently reflecting that now Henry must have arrived at Northanger, now he must have heard of her departure, and now, perhaps, they were all setting off for Hereford. Poor Catherine, right? Yeah. Yeah. We knew there had to be a crisis, right? There has to be some kind of conflict, some kind of crisis, a climax to the drama. The thing that I think is most interesting about what Jane Austen has done here also is that she has actually given us a gothic moment where it's a mystery. We don't know why she's being sent away. We don't know what's going on. And we are treated to at the end of, well, no, towards, towards the end of the first chapter, while Catherine is learning all of this and, and readying herself to leave, the weather is quite gothic and she is absolutely unmoved by it. So instead of dwelling in the, oh, I'm living a drama now and, oh, the setting that I happen to be in is gothic, she's being a real person dealing with a real situation that is just awful. So that is a little interesting. I find I found that to be kind of awesome. Yay, Jane Austen. The other thing that I thought was pretty interesting in the first of the two chapters that we did was Eleanor's shame at not being the master of her own domain or mistress of her own domain, that her father is deciding everything even though as the only adult-ish woman of the household, she should be the one who is determining how guests are treated. She is not able to perform that duty because her father is usurping that duty from her. That said, Jane Austen, as good as she is at being funny and having a light touch and getting her timings right and treatment of horses correct as she writes these books, She also understands money in a way that perhaps other writers of the time didn't. And I thought it was really telling when Eleanor offers Catherine money to get home. The difficulty of having that conversation shouldn't be passed over. The difficulty of the situation they are putting Catherine in should not be passed over either. For Catherine to be sent out without any servant, a manservant, anyone from the house accompanying her, she expected that they would at least accompany her halfway, get her, you know, close enough to home that she's familiar with the terrain, but she doesn't even get that. It, it really was unsafe still for especially a young woman, a young untested woman, to travel 70 miles by herself. Jane Austen clearly decided that that was not going to be part of the crisis, was something bad happening to Catherine on the journey. And thank goodness, because I don't think I could have handled that. Nor could Eleanor, I'm sure, if she'd heard about it afterwards. But this really is scandalous. 
what General Tilney has done. And of course, we don't know why. And the other thing is, by her saying in the second chapter we, we listened to today, that Catherine traveled on for about 11 hours without accident or alarm, that indicates that she was probably not stopping to eat. She was probably just letting them switch the horses, getting back in and getting gone. She may have had snacks along the way, but she didn't really get a decent meal. And she certainly didn't eat breakfast either. So this has been an unpleasant journey in many, many ways for the poor girl. And so we end with poor Catherine recognizing the fact that by this point in time, Henry has probably gotten home, found out that she has gone, and he and his family are heading off to this, quote unquote, air quotes here, previous engagement that General Tilney had just, you know, forgotten about, which sounds so like him. (sighs) And that's a, a hard place for her to be. Switching back to her normal life at this point for her is not going to be easy. Mrs. Allen is still Mrs. Allen. Uh, Everything comes down to a question of fashion and fabric, which of course is how we met Henry Tilney in the first place, as he was a connoisseur of fine muslin. But this is, this is hard. This is, this is Catherine growing up. And so now in the last set of chapters, Next week, we will get to see how she does the growing up and how she's turned out. And with that, I'm going to leave you. However, I'm going to play you out with several voicemails. You will hear first from Jessica, who has an app to share and a YouTube video to share. Everything she mentions is linked out to in the show notes. And then you'll hear from Tara, and she mentions a YouTube channel as well. I found the video she is talking about, and that is also linked to from the show notes for you. And I think that's it. All right, let's listen to our voicemails. And as always, be well, take care of yourself, take care of each other, wear your mask, get a vaccine. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hey guys, this is Jessica. It's been quite a while since I left a comment, and I'm just catching up on Northanger Abbey, and I wanted to share two bits of information. The first is a really cool app called Seek, S-E-E-K, and it is a great free app that you can use to identify different plants and animals. I use it frequently on insects to tell whether or not that spider is poisonous or not, and my little cousin loves to use it to go out and identify the different mushrooms that are growing in her yard. Her favorite is dog vomit slime mold. Yes, that exists. Um, The other bit of information I wanted to share with listeners is a YouTube channel. The other free thing that I wanted to share with you guys is a YouTube channel by Dr. Octavia Cox, C-O-X. She has some really great videos where she explores classic literature and really breaks down the text. The one I wanted to share with you was about did John Thorpe propose, and that was really eye-opening, the way that that scene could be read both as a proposal and as completely not a proposal. So go check it out. Free app, free YouTube vid channel. It was awesome. Hello, Heather. It is Tara Worcester, and I have some Harry Potter movie trivia knowledge for you. Did you know that the scene when Harry first encounters Diagon Alley, they actually only use the same, like, what was it, like, 10 feet of set. But if you watch carefully, you see the same witches pawing through the dried flowers in every single angle of that scene that's shot there whenever Hagrid is walking Harry down the Diagon Alley. You see it, like, 11 times or something like that. It's hilarious. I found it on Pinterest via Tumblr via Reddit. And, like, you can see they they screenshot every time the same witches are pawing through the cart of flowers. It was so funny. And my other piece of knowledge for you is you can eat honeysuckle flowers. Go back. Go back to Honeysuckle Road and pick, like, a third of them. 
and eat them. You can eat the nectar and honey fla- uh, honeysuckle flowers, but don't eat the berries because they're poisonous to everybody. But yes, you can eat the honeysuckle flowers. The nectar is very, very sweet. So I'm at the part in the chapter where they're visiting the son's house. Catherine commented on the one room where you could see the cottage to the apple tree up the window and how, why isn't this room made up yet? And it's perfect for this, that, and the other. And, well, yes, if it was made up to a lady's taste. And the general was asking her um, recommendations. I kid you not, I have lived this moment in my life. Oh, my goodness. I was in high school. The boyfriend I had at the time was working with his dad to fix up part of his workshop was in this big warehouse style building. And I was like, oh, you can do this over here and that over there. And hey, you should put this in this place here. And then you can build this thing for this thing and have storage over here and da 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 da. Rattling on like a lunatic because, you know, oh, there's so much opportunity and I'm such a people pleaser and let me help you finish this thing. And oh, yeah, your life is so much easier because that's the kind of person I am. And the dad goes, oh, really? And poignantly does a slow turn to the son with that, please, by all the gods, make this woman my daughter-in-law so that she can help me do this because she's a genius. And the boyfriend at the time turned 17 shades of embarrassed and proceeded to clam up like an idiot, which, of course, that's exactly what I did because the boyfriend was embarrassed because I had embarrassed him, so therefore I was embarrassed. And I said nothing else for the next eight hours I was with them working in this warehouse shed. And it's one of those, oh, I have lived that embarrassment. And I had to share. Hi, Heather. It's Tara again. I remembered something I meant to tell you about last week, but I totally forgot because chaos. Um, directions on letters. Um, you were talking about how they would be folded very small and usually wrapped up in a string, and then the string knot would be sealed so you could see if it was open. If you want to see a demonstration of this, Morgan Donner on YouTube, she does 15th century and slash medieval uh, garment recreation, and she has this adorable ribbon-tied hair, and she's amazing for – Cost tube secret Santa. I want to say it was 2019. I could be wrong. She made a mulled wine spice mix to send to Kathy Hay, also on YouTube. She's amazing. She's currently endeavoring to create worse peacock dress for the Princess of India. It's amazing. She wrote, Morgan wrote Kathy a letter and sealed it in the way you're describing. She also did a very beautiful cloth, wax, and string seal on the mold spice wine mix as well. So if you want a demonstration of that, you can go watch Morgan's content for the 2019 Cost Tube Secret Santa Exchange. And consuming Morgan Donner's content in general is delightfully relaxing and you all of a sudden want to put ribbons in your hair and throw off all of your elastics and make yourself amazing garments out of beautiful wool and then go frolic in a field and go do uh what is it sea reenacting she's amazing go watch her she's currently in the middle of a move so she's not posting content as much right now but uh she did post a video recently where she went to go see these potters, more pottery, who recreate ancient designs on their pots. Uh, The one that Morgan was getting replaced was actually a recreation of a 15th century pattern. That's really beautiful. It's reds and whites and blues and blacks. So Morgan Donner for ribbon uh, ribbon and wax sealed letters and Kathy Hay for very soft-spoken motivation content as well. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, 
Nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlet. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>